Good morning and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Going to be covering a topic that I like talking about with some frequency on this channel, and that is interstellar travel, except this time we're taking it to new levels. How could we possibly travel between stars in something resembling a reasonable time frame? And if you clicked on this because of the concept of going at 10 light years in the space of only a week, well, I am not exaggerating here, at least as far as the passengers on board are concerned. Those of you who are familiar with the concept of time dilation will realize that funny things happen when you get very, very close to the speed of light. So although time will be passing normally from outside observer standpoints, for the people traveling on board the ship, and really that's what matters, if you get extremely close to the speed of light, your ability to traverse enormous distances becomes a lot more feasible. And before I go on, first of all, I ask you guys to please subscribe. I am now just over 3,700 subscribers away from that magical 100K. I've been growing like crazy lately. Thank you so much for that. And as I say, that 100K is a magic number on a number of levels from YouTube and also from my 100K challenge. So that having been said, let's move on. So how do you get really, really close to the speed of light? In this case, 99.85% of the speed of light? Well, there's nothing in Einstein's general theory of relativity that forbids you from doing it. But from a technological standpoint and from a pure logistical standpoint, it will be incredibly difficult to travel this fast but not necessarily impossible. And one particular ship that I'm going to introduce you to today is a hybrid type of ship that employs a couple of different methods allowing it to travel to these unbelievable speeds, putting the galaxy within our reach. This is the Echo Lance, the creation of Dr. Robert Duncan Ensman, and you may be familiar with that name because I've talked about some of his Starship ideas in the past. And by the way, this was created by Nick Stevens Graphics, an unbelievably talented guy. I recommend that you visit both the Ensman Archive and also Nick Stevens' YouTube channel and subscribe to both of them. Before his death on October 19th, 2020, Dr. Ensman came up with a lot of groundbreaking ideas on how to travel close to the speed of light, or at least a substantial percentage of the speed of light. And his wife, Joanna Ensman, herself an MIT graduate, has been continuing that work. As a matter of fact, they just released a book about the Echo Lance last month. And today, I'm just bringing you an introduction to this remarkable ship before I do a more in-depth analysis of this book and give you what's probably going to be a multi-part series about it. But here are the basics behind the ship. Instead of using traditional types of propellants or even nuclear power, the idea behind the Echo Lance is to use particle accelerators, nine of them to be precise, and then to accelerate the propellant to a speed nearly that of light as long as it's ionized and being propelled by a magnetic field, you can attain those kinds of speeds and then use the relativistic propellant to reach these kinds of speeds eventually. Now, this is something that is not easy to attain and it requires an enormous amount of power. So even though it's not using the nuclear engines to directly produce thrust, you need several nuclear reactors running the length of the ship in order to drive that much propellant to relativistic speed. So in the nose cone of the 
the ship, that's where you keep all of the fuel. Since the fuel has to be driven the length of the ship in order to reach relativistic speeds, it's liquid hydrogen, or actually hydrogen snow, frozen hydrogen to be precise. And also at the front, you have something called Fresnel deflectors. Now, my understanding of Fresnel deflectors, and I could be wrong here, is they are electromagnetic shields which will protect the occupants of the ship and the ship itself from incoming particles that are going to be traveling faster and faster as the ship accelerates. The deflector uses a high energy laser to ionize any particles ahead of the ship and then the electromagnetic field draws it into a scoop, safely drawing it away from the passengers and actually using it for fuel in the future. That's not how you get the ship going to begin with, as would be the case with a ship called a Bussard Ramjet, but it is something that supplements the speed of the ship later on. We'll get to that in just a moment. The ship is utterly colossal, a kilometer or so in length being comprised of four identical modules, each of which contains hundreds of crew cabins, along with mini farms, factories, shops, parks, schools, all of them maintained in rotating artificial gravity, by the way, so you don't have muscle mass and bone deterioration during the journey. You also have backup reactors and extensive electromagnetic shielding to contain the ionized plasma that's passing down the particle accelerators that run the length of the ship. And once again, the particles being driven by this reaction are traveling at nearly the speed of light, which is how the ship eventually attains these incredible speeds in a simple and rather extreme application of Newton's third law. But the ship could not carry enough frozen hydrogen in order to drive something this big to these kinds of velocities without running out of fuel. So how do you get around that problem? Well, by using the same Fresnel deflector that you use in order to protect the ship by also dra drawing in fresh propellant. This is an application that was used previously by a Bussard ramjet. However, a Bussard ramjet is not traveling fast enough in order to draw in the necessary propellant to get any sort of considerable acceleration. There just isn't enough hydrogen in interstellar space in order to achieve that. However, if you're already going a substantial percentage of the speed of light, 6% or so, that's fast enough to keep the process going. Let me review this again real quick. The big problem that a Bussard ramjet has, and for those of you unfamiliar with that, it's based on the principle of drawing in interstellar hydrogen, ionizing it, and then accelerating it out the back of the ship in order to gain speeds that are somewhere close to the speed of light. But there just isn't enough hydrogen in interstellar space to accommodate that. But if you're already traveling about 6% of the speed of light, you're encountering enough hydrogen. The faster you go, the more hydrogen you encounter in order to keep the process sustainable and to maintain a constant of acceleration of at least 1g. It would actually be a little bit more than that. At a constant acceleration of 1.228 Gs, you can reach a speed of 99.85% of the speed of light in four months an amazing velocity which really opens up lots of possibilities for interstellar travel. Even though you're not traveling between the stars any faster than light, which means traveling to Alpha Centauri would still take you between five and six years. As far as the passengers on board are concerned, they wouldn't experience that kind of time passage at all. And lots of other funny things would start to happen as well because of a phenomena called time dilation. First of all, your perception of the universe would completely change. Not only would the phenomenon of blue shift and red shift change the way you look to outside observers, but it would also change everything about how you view the universe. Everything in front of you would start to be crushed together into a blurry tunnel because the wavelength of the light striking you 
would be completely compressed. It would totally change the way the universe looks and would frankly make navigation incredibly difficult if you didn't set things up properly beforehand. Things get very, very bizarre when you travel close to the speed of light, but the most significant change is the passage of time. If you reach a speed of 99.85% of the speed of light for every year that passes on board ship, approximately 500 years is passing in the outside universe. This may seem completely contrary to everything we understand and everything we experience, but as I said before, funny things happen when you travel that close to the speed of light. Therefore, people on board a ship traveling at this kind of velocity would be able to traverse 10 light years per week as far as their time was concerned and arrive at very distant stars in our galaxy in a reasonable amount of time. More significantly, it puts very interesting planets that are relatively close to our sun well within our striking range. For example, the Gliese 1002 system, which apparently has two planets within its habitable zone. This is located only 15.8 light years away. Now, of course, it would take roughly 16 and a half years or so to reach it from an outside observer standpoint, but once again, Again, if you were on a ship like the Echo Lance, it would take less than a year, approximately four months at a constant 1G acceleration to reach 99.85% of the speed light, then just a week and a half in order to traverse the vast majority of the rest of the distance involved, and then another four months to decelerate. This changes everything, at least as far as travelers are concerned. It adds a lot of complexity as far as human society is concerned, because you would have a completely different class of human being that would live for many decades, if not centuries, whereas everybody else would would age at the normal rate. Imagine a future where there is an entire class of human beings who crew these ships who essentially never die, at least as far as outside observers are concerned. These people, of course, would be unable to really maintain any sort of meaningful relationships with people who stay put on their planetary system of choice and would instead develop relationships with people who travel for a living, assuming anybody actually did that. It might be so difficult and hard on the human psyche to go through that kind of trauma, and most people might simply decide to make one of these kinds of journeys and then settle in a different planetary system. But not necessarily. There might be a group of humans who would be so excited at the prospect of seeing the future for themselves that they might decide to travel on one of these ships as a permanent occupation. Imagine being a young crew member just signing on to one of these ships, or perhaps a newer version of one of these ships, and encountering a grizzled old engineer who'd been around for a couple of centuries, or perhaps even longer. He might not even be that old. Such a thing would create some serious culture shocks. But getting back to Gliese 1002, it's an attractive system for a couple of reasons. Not only because there's two planets in the habitable zone, but also because it's a relatively quiet red dwarf star. A lot of our concerns about red dwarf systems are the fact that they tend to have relatively frequent flare-ups bathing the planetary system in lots of radiation, which would be incredibly hostile to any sort of life, but not Gliese 1002, at least as far as we know. The planets themselves, however, would still be tidally locked, with one side of the planet permanently facing the star and one side in perpetual darkness. This might seem Seem to make any planets orbiting a red dwarf uninhabitable, but not necessarily. A number of climatological models have been created by planetologists suggests that the twilight regions of these planets, that is to say the region bordering the light and dark sides, would actually be not only habitable, but fairly pleasant, even though the storms that would rage between the two sides of the planet might be pretty unpleasant. Not necessarily the best place to inhabit, and this would also be the case of the famous TRAPPIST-1 system that has several planets within the habitable zone, but once again, a dwarf star and tidally locked. 
Are there any stars relatively close to our own that are similar to our own as well and don't have any tidally locked planets? Well, yes, there are quite a number. And if you can reach these stars in a reasonable amount of time, again, as far as the passengers are concerned, it changes everything as far as colonizing the galaxy is concerned. For example, Sigma Draconis is located about 18.8 light years away from our sun. It's a G-class star, very similar to our own. And if it has if it has any planets in the habitable zone, and we're not certain of that yet, they would probably be very attractive candidates, not only for colonization, but also for possible alien life. But it doesn't have to be restricted to that. Keep in mind, you're talking about 10 light years per week. 500 light years per year. So if you're not worried about the people back home, if you're willing to travel over a thousand years in the future, so to speak, by traveling to a distant star system, you can, in theory, do it with a ship like the Echo Lance. For example, let's say we wanted to go to Tabby Star that I talk about on a regular basis and finally determine what really is out there. It's about 1,500 light years years away, which means it would take less than four years to get there, again, as far as the crew of the Echo Lance would be concerned. Granted, you would never see any of your family members, anybody you ever known, or even their distant descendants ever again. But you would have the unique opportunity to travel to a planetary system over a thousand light years away from home and over a thousand years into the future. And there's also one other very important important consideration that we need to keep in mind. Although this type of ship is something that we are unlikely to build anytime in the next century or two, although who knows, Dr. Ensman firmly believed that such ships are within our technological capability within the next few decades, let alone centuries. But regardless, if we can imagine and conceive of ships like this, somebody else probably has as well. And if there are planetary systems that are theoretically capable of hosting alien life within 20 light years of our own planet, there's a good chance that that intelligent life has already observed evidence of our civilization, techno signatures, so to speak. And if they have this kind of technology, they could, in theory, already be here. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. Please stay tuned for a future episode where I'm going to delve into the particulars of this ship in a lot more detail. And also, please check the description for various ways to support my content so I can keep this stuff coming. And as always, stay angry about space.